American President Woodrow Wilson Historically has been regarded highly, though in recent times has been shot down and relegated to the bottom of the barrel, and seemingly from across the political spectrum as well. Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Greens, Liberals, and Conservatives increasingly appear to carry a negative opinion of Wilson for any number of individual or combination of reasons. While Wilson has suffered these blows to his reputation, almost paradoxically has another president from the same era risen to tremendous popularity in spite of many of these same, if not more extreme, actions and ideological leanings. That president was the much-beloved Theodore Roosevelt, and we'll be referencing him and the progressive movement of the day repeatedly throughout this video. Most often pinned on Wilson are accusations of tyranny, racism, imperialism, hypocrisy, incompetence, warmongering, etc. Great hate seems to stem from a belief that he was particularly responsible for actions which in reality were the product of years of progressive policy, from a belief that he somehow altered or compromised the progressive movement, from a belief that he stood widely apart from other progressives of the day, and alone must shoulder the scorn for all which might have gone wrong during those decades. Moreover, that so much wrong occurred during those days, when in fact we find great justification and acceptance from the public of the time in regard to actions taken by the Wilson administration. Of course, I'll preface this and later conclude as well by stating that I do not personally agree with all of the policies and ideologies of Woodrow Wilson, but rather recognize a very unjust mischaracterization of a historic figure and feel it only right to correct such misunderstanding through insight. Wilson has been accused of taking the use of government power to unprecedented and unjustified heights in his creation of new business regulations, establishing the income tax, establishing the Federal Reserve, and prosecuting anti-American and extremist individuals during and immediately following the American entry into the Great War. On regulation, Wilson's Federal Trade Commission was a more efficient successor to Roosevelt's Bureau of Corporations, which could not regulate but only investigate and bring such findings before a court, allowing unscrupulous businesses to navigate loopholes during this long process. Wilson's FTC, on the other hand, could now investigate and act immediately, bringing a rapid end to illegal and unfair practices, as well as prevent the formation of monopolies and trusts before they had a chance to establish themselves by giving the government direct oversight and final say whenever large businesses decided to merge. On taxation, Wilson merely built upon the work and infrastructure of his predecessors, Roosevelt and Taft, by putting the previously established 16th Amendment which authorized Congress to collect taxes on income to work. Wilson's tax was a mere 1 to 6% for only the top 3% of the population. The revenue accumulated from this tax, allowing Wilson to cut tariffs by nearly half, and thus significantly reduce the price of imported products for the entire country. On the Federal Reserve, it must be stressed that Wilson inherited the Federal Reserve plan from a commission originally established during the Roosevelt administration, which sought to create a centralized banking system now that the US had gone from a regional and developing power to a global power. Wilson not wanting to establish a central bank per se, given the country's bumpy history with such systems, modified the plan by introducing elements which turned it into a semi-private, semi-public institution. However, its function remained largely the same as was intended by the commission, and the new plan was largely praised by progressives of the day, who saw it as a solution to America's economic instability. Whether it was successful is extremely questionable, and what Wilson can be faulted for if truly the reserve is a faulty system is merely that he happened to be the man to sign it into existence. Had Roosevelt, Taft, or any other progressive of the day been in his position, it almost certainly would have been created regardless. On the Espionage and Sedition Acts, America had faced internal strife for some time by the presidency of Wilson, primarily actions perpetrated by recent immigrants who subscribed to anarchist and socialist ideologies from Europe and engaged in violent action against American citizens. With the outbreak of the Great War, fears abounded of foreign actors attempting to harm or provoke the United States. The British were eager to have the United States on their side and may not have been above putting American lives in danger to accomplish that goal. Meanwhile, the Germans were more interested in causing trouble that would keep the United States preoccupied and out of Europe perhaps inciting a large population of German Americans into rebellion, or provoking Mexico to initiate a war with its northern neighbor. Wilson was not willing to accept this risk, and until threats subsided, sought to cracking down on seditious speech, and roughly a thousand individuals were prosecuted. Following the end of the Great War, and as the Russian Civil War raged on, inspiring far-left activities across Europe, a series of anarchist-inspired bombings and assassination attempts on prominent Americans were made, provoking a surge of arrests in an attempt to quell what many feared could be an anarchist or communist uprising within the US. The morality of these actions are not purely black and white. They were desperate actions during desperate times, not unfamiliar to American policy whenever it finds itself drawn into foreign affairs, one of the earliest laws passed in this country after all having been the Alien and Sedition Act, meant to serve much of the same purpose when war with France was a strong possibility. To wholly dismiss the circumstances surrounding Wilson's reasoning for resorting to this decision and then moralizing it as merely bad is plainly unjust. In summary, Wilson's use of government power was not without justification nor precedent, nor was it out of line with progressive governing strategies used by his predecessors Taft and Roosevelt. As was expected of a progressive, Wilson utilized federal power to produce efficiency, security, and greater prosperity for the majority, 
even if at the expense of a wealthy, deviant, or criminal minority. Wilson has been accused of intensifying segregation in government, giving rise to the second Ku Klux Klan, and as many like to say, being racist even for his time. On the matter of government segregation, the exclusion or disfavor of black employees, what was known as the Lily White Movement, was by and large a product of its day, and more so of progressivism in particular. I touch on this in great detail in this video here, but to summarize, progressivism of the day was obsessed with efficiency and purity. As the belief of many went, you could not have an efficient society or system if there were deviant factors which refused to assimilate and act in harmony with the rest. Blacks were commonly seen as less American than most immigrants, said immigrants being largely white and thus able to blend more seamlessly into the American culture over time. Racial tensions at the time were very high, especially as many blacks began moving in great number from the south to the north, and progressive politicians responded to this by ostracizing blacks from their ranks. Following a much criticized dinner with Booker T. Washington, Roosevelt caved to public desires and embraced the Lily White movement. Taft did the same, and Wilson, also being a progressive, followed suit. While Wilson allowed Lily Whiteism to continue, once again we have an instance of if virtually any other progressive was in power instead of him, it would have happened anyway, and these actions are a product of the progressive culture of the time, not a product of Wilson being quote, racist even for his time. One might even argue that Wilson did more for blacks than other progressives and that he took a clear and vocal position against lynching, demanding state governors take action to end what he called a disgraceful evil. On the matter of the second Ku Klux Klan, it is argued that Wilson gave legitimacy to the movement by hosting a screening of the birth of a nation at the White House. The movie, by the time of its creation, had already been a widely popular novel and play by the name of the Klansman. Despite its controversial portrayal of the first Ku Klux Klan in its final acts, the film was still hailed for pioneering a number of cinematic innovations, which brought it great attention. Wilson had known the writer of the original novel that the film was based on, Thomas Dixon, as a university peer, and he was indebted to him for an honorary degree and speaking opportunity he had provided to him years ago. So when Wilson was contacted by Dixon requesting a screening of the film, he obliged but apparently didn't know much else about the film other than it was a history piece about the Civil War and Reconstruction, subjects of great interest to Wilson given his background in American history. Now despite this, The Birth of a Nation was not even treated as the feature presentation of this first ever movie showing at the White House, but rather followed an earlier screening of the Italian film Cabiria, also hailed for its cinematic innovations. The screening certainly did bring more attention to what was already a widely discussed film praised for its use of new technologies and cinematography, not to mention being based on an extremely popular novel, though of course it's so much easier to say that it was Wilson's screening that made it popular in the first place. To say that allowing the film to be shown reveals a secret racism of Wilson's or that it promoted a secret agenda is nothing more than looking for patterns where there are none. And views have been further skewed by tabloid allegations printed decades after the original screening and well after Wilson had passed away, claiming that Wilson said, It is like writing history with lightning and my only regret is that it is all terribly true. The evidence of Wilson saying this being virtually non-existent and the probability that he had said it is rather low, given that the portrayal of the Klan in the film deviates from Wilson's own historic writings. Now, to suggest that this showing gave rise or legitimacy to the second Ku Klux Klan is also a far stretch, and once again we find cause not in Wilson but in the progressive society of the day, which popularized the Klansman before it had even become a film. Wilson, an apparently unassuming actor in this timeline of events, should not serve as a scapegoat for the some 4 million who would actually go on to join the organization and give it life. Wilson wasn't in fact racist even for his time, but rather in step with if not more moderate than the popular beliefs of his day, and to single him out as is so often done is senseless ignorance. Wilson has been accused of recklessly pursuing war despite campaigning on neutrality, acting militantly against U.S. neighbors in Central America and the Caribbean, and ultimately paving the way for modern American interventionism. On local intervention, Wilson inherited the border war with Mexico from the Taft administration, not to mention several floating interests and threats that resulted from the Spanish-American War of the McKinley administration and the interventions of the Roosevelt Corollary. These lands south of America's border were terribly unstable and dangerous to both American citizens and economic interests within their borders. Thus, American efforts had since been focused on bringing stability and order to these lands on their doorstep. Wilson absolutely despised what he perceived as the militarism and imperialism brought to America by Roosevelt. Having grown up during the Civil War, Wilson came to view war as senseless destruction that was almost always avoidable, and as such hoped to abandon the military approach to Latin America in favor of arbitration, partnership, and the establishment of a Pan-American League. But these efforts ultimately fell short and proved insufficient to prevent the further destabilization of these countries, forcing continued military action. This kind of interventionism is not unique to Wilson, but part and parcel of the Progressive Era. But unlike his predecessors, Wilson at least attempted to find an alternative. On the US's entry into the Great War, Wilson from the very beginning sought neutrality and did all he could to maintain it, but repeatedly the Entente and Central Powers provoked American action. 
Wilson had for years retained peace through diplomacy, even in the face of blockades, attacks on American vessels, attempts at provoking insurrection and protests within the United States, and attempts at provoking war between the US and its neighbors. Wilson soon realized that despite his best efforts, peace could not be achieved through diplomacy alone. Germany was in fact directly and repeatedly threatening the security of America and its citizens, and thus the country must retaliate. Wilson did in fact run for a second term on the slogan that he quote, kept us out of war. However, public opinion had quickly shifted in favor of war upon Germany's doubling down on unrestricted submarine warfare and the revelation of the Zimmermann telegram. The war was further framed as a conflict between democracy and tyranny, though this was largely a fanciful interpretation meant to simply bolster American support. Wilson saw the conflict for what it really was, petty squabbling between great powers that grew too big for them to handle, and this understanding is reflected in his attempt to settle disputes as an outside and neutral arbitrator and provide for the needs of all Europe's distinct people through a redrawing of borders and the establishing of a collaborative League of Nations, plans which the Germans favored as reasonable and which brought them to the negotiating table. But the victorious European Entente refused to concede their claim of spoils, and sought to treat Germany not with reconciliation, but with punishment and suppression. Enough that it might never rise to challenge the likes of France and Britain again. Ironically, it would be these punitive measures by the Entente that ultimately drove Germany down the road to radicalism, and drove Europe to the point of a second great war. Wilson's decision to enter the war was not unjustified, and it is clear that he had pursued every reasonable alternative up to that point until finally he and a majority of the country determined that enough was enough. Wilson can neither be blamed for the Entente's refusal of his 14 points, nor for Congress's refusal to allow the US to join the League of Nations, nor the chaos which ensued in Europe in later years. In warfare and interventionism, Wilson was an idealist who did what he could to avoid conflict, promote cooperation, and ensure fair play by his idealized vision of American democracy. But reality collided with that idealism and forced him to resort to measures not at all unorthodox or extreme, but perfectly in line with the logic of his predecessors and with the tastes of his day. In conclusion, we find the accusations levied against President Wilson to be great mischaracterizations based on a misunderstanding of his actions and the actions of his predecessors, based in a misunderstanding of politics and culture of the time, and based upon a narrow view of Wilson's administration and his personal character. Once again, I state that I do not personally align myself with the ideology and actions of Woodrow Wilson, however I acknowledge that there is much confusion and misdirection regarding this historic figure, who by the standards of his day, executed the duties of his office effectively and well enough in line with popular consensus, as well as followed through with the agendas of the progressive movement and the agendas of the presidents who preceded him. Having additionally successfully promoted conservation, cracked down on corruption, and promoted labor rights and securities, including working to end child labor. It's clear why Wilson has historically been regarded highly as a president, and only in recent years has that reputation been wrongly warped. The US of Z thanks for watching. Support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z, out.